NASCAR Championship weekend less than four months away right here in the Valley at Phoenix Raceway for Champions Crown in three days. Yeah, it's coming up quick, so we're going to get you ready for it. I am Devin Henry, your host here on the Inside Lane, and one of the rookie drivers who will most likely be making an appearance throughout the NASCAR Camper World Truck Series playoffs joins us now to look ahead and a little bit back on his season. He is the 2020 Winchester 400 champion, the 2017 Berlin Raceway track champion, and your current leader of the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series Rookie of the Year points. The driver of the Nice Motorsports number 42 from Portage, Michigan, it's Carson Hosevar. Carson, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Hey, you have been doing phenomenal so far in your rookie campaign. You're only 18 years old. You're giving those veterans a run for their money. But just looking back at Knoxville, you look like an old school dirt guy. You got the plain white truck unsponsored it didn't matter because you bought that plain white truck up front it's been a fun year it looks like for the most part but i know that it's been tough trying to get those sponsorships along and just keeping everything in focus to be top 10 in points like you are yeah i mean it's uh definitely hasn't been easy by any means we've had our, our struggles at times but uh a lot of a lot of highs also so it uh makes all your year worth it a lot of highs starting at Daytona to begin the year, the first of uh, three top fives of the season. Like I said, you put on a show at Knoxville. You're top ten in the points, and with only one race left into the playoffs, you have put yourself in a position to put Nice Motorsports back into the playoffs. And this isn't necessarily the same kind of Nice Motorsports that it was back when Ross Chastain was fighting for a championship. Things have changed, things have maneuvered, and you have been overachieving in the equipment that you have been in seemingly week in and week out. So for you personally, what have been some of the bigger lessons learned here in your rookie season that you've been utilizing to get yourself potentially into the playoffs? Uh, I mean, the biggest thing is, is learning the trucks more than anything, because, you know, I started as, I don't want to say the B team, but uh, you know, the second hand, maybe third hand to, to Moffat, you know, so I was kind of leaning on him and in the direction we were going to take our trucks was kind of leaning on him. You know, he's he's won championship before and, and won a lot of races. And uh, when he's, he left, it was kind of, OK, it's it's up to me now. Uh, and we ran really good. We were in third at Darlington, second at Charlotte. And we really clicked on and what what we needed to do and what where we needed to take our trucks and what direction for our setups and everything. And. It was kind of different because I was the one, yeah, you know, being the head guy on, and that I'm relying on our my feedback and what direction. Um, so it's it was big for me to kind of want my direction, and and we put together our two best runs so far. The 18 year old leading the way and giving all the feedback in his rookie season. And for you, even though there's a month off in the truck series schedule, you're still going out and racing. You've won a plethora of late model races in your young career so far, but. You know, you're running ARC a little bit while still jumping into the late model. Now you're learning the truck, like you said, jumping back into the late model. For you, how difficult is it with your mindset, with the mentality, to be swapping back and forth between cars basically multiple times a week sometimes? Uh, I mean, it's it's definitely different, uh, you know, for everything. Your, your mind has to mentally adjust because of how low you're sitting in the late model and how close the steering wheel is, how close everything is. It's real tight. And then the truck, you get in there and it's feel like you're just sitting up in a desk chair and, you know, on top of everything. So it's, um, takes you a minute or two, but, uh, you know, luckily you get some pace laps, especially without practice, you get some pace laps. And, and by the time, uh, you know, I'm taking the green, it's, it's business as usual for me, at least. And like a lot of, a lot of young race car drivers, you're grinding, grinding, in race cars, every opportunity that you can. And a lot of people now know you as Carson Hosevar at the racetrack, but I kind of want to know who is Carson Hosevar away from the racetrack? Do you have any, any hobbies? Do you like to, to go out and do things besides racing? Do you do you collect anything like, I don't know, sports cards or coins or jewelry, kind of like your dad goes out and sells? Well, who is Carson Hosevar away from the racetrack? Uh, I mean, I just, I like to have fun more than anything. I think everybody does, but, uh, you know, I try to travel with the guys as much as possible. I go to the shop, I'll wear dumb hats, dumb t-shirts just for a laugh. You know, I'm just trying to be the biggest jokester of all, 
all time, basically, uh, just to try to keep everybody's spirits up. You know, we we play basketball outside the shop all the time, and I keep telling them, you know, that that can of whoop ass is is on way. It's just <laughs> COVID restrictions. Just it's waiting a few days. Delivery's waiting, but. Um, but no, I try to have as much fun as possible. Um, you know, I train a lot. That's kind of my, my getaway. I try to work out. It's fun. Uh, you know, I got a bike now, so I kick my butt every time I try to do that. But, uh, yeah, I just try to have as much fun and, and create as much jokes and have everybody smiling around me. All right, so I want to take me through this room that you're in. You got a late model door in there. You're obviously on like a sim rig. You got some guitar trophies. What room are you in? Kind of take me through. Like, there's a lot going on in this room. I love it. Yeah, uh, I'm right now in my basement. Normally, I'm in North Carolina, but uh, I'm in my basement of my house in uh, Michigan. So I got gym equipment on the floor, boxes, and I got these uh, cars. Um, from a guy so when I, I just happened to give it to me. He was trying to get rid of them. He was moving. So he got gave them all to me. And then I got the late mall door from Redbud 400 when I won that quarter midget trophies, a movie theater. When we bought the house, we showed up and that, and they never took it. So we just kept it. So it was perfect. I love it. That's got to be kind of a nice place to kind of hang out and relax a little bit. Talking with Carson Hosevar here on the inside lane, the driver of the Nice Motorsports, number 42 machine. And now I kind of want to get into the real talk. You're like what, six foot five? Like not all race cars and seats are made equally. Like you and yeah, Michael about, Waltrip are like here. Yeah, my, uh, my interior uh, girl doesn't like me that much because she has to... I'm I'm really easy, but she has to build everything, especially like last year when I ran part time. We had Natalie, Ty, who are very short, and then there was me. <laughs> so it was just she hated me. She did not like it. She's like, y'all need to figure it out. Like y'all need to do your own interior. But uh, but yeah, I'm about six four. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's funny. And sometimes as a race car driver, you don't necessarily get to pick your seat and, and your cockpit all the time because sometimes the car isn't yours or sometimes you got to jump in late or something like that. But have you had any close calls because of size before? Uh, I was supposed to do the Architest at Charlotte and my knees were a little bit because the dashes are so low in those. And my knees were pretty close and they were like, no, this is, this is just a bad idea. Like, I'm just sitting there. Yeah, it's fine. Like, who cares? Like... They're like, well, what if you crash or you rip your knees off? I was like, well, that's it's no problem. Just don't crash, you know. <laughs> why are we gonna crash? Like, why are we thinking about bad things? Like, but yeah, just well, before, funny. Before I let you go, you're not a traditional dirt guy that we think of that came up through the ranks like a Kyle Larson or a Christopher Bell, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. But you still seem to have this special connection to Brian Clausen, who he did a little bit of everything, IndyCar, a little bit asphalt here, tried to get into NASCAR, but he's primarily a dirt guy. And the legacy that he left primarily touches a lot of the dirt racer. And even though most pavement guys don't have that kind of connection that a lot of dirt guys do to Brian Clausen, you're always rocking the BC hat. You had the BC logo on your truck at Eldora. And even though you don't necessarily have that dirt experience growing up, you even raced pretty well on dirt, it looks like, so far this season in the Camping World Truck Series. But because you didn't grow up in that dirt community, you kind of grew up another place where Brian Clausen was still kind of around. I'm really curious, where did this connection to BC come from for you? Because it seems extremely meaningful and dear to you. And what does Brian mean to you? I mean, well, first he where I met him was at the quarter minute track, um, kind of mutual friends between parents, um, with, uh, another driver that I knew his parents, this and that, and either way met, met Brian and Tim, um, and they were kind of interested in, in me. They saw something at the quarter minute track and were helping me out, trying to learn what I knew and, and, trying to driver coach just a little bit and they had a development program and we went and tested a micro sprint for the first time. First time ever on dirt. I wasn't great, but uh, they, they did stuff with race car with the race car. And I told them exactly what, you know, they kind of did. They tied the left rear down and I told them that and they were, that's what kind of 
brought me up and they wanted to do sort of a development deal and try to go world outlaw racing in a handful of years. And it was either go dirt racing or go asphalt racing with uh, Johnny Benson. I'm, of course, I'm sitting there, man, let's, let's do both. And it didn't quite work out. And I've always stayed, stayed in touch. And that was really big for me. And it was really tough to say no, because, you know, that was, that was my guy, you know, that was, I watched Brian all the time and how he presented himself at the racetrack, off the racetrack, everything, you know, he was my idol. And uh, so when he passed away, I sat there and bawled for two days and just, uh, you know, I still want to try and pay tribute and, you know, he's, he's still my guy. And I'm someone who'd even have the honor of meeting Brian Clausen in person, but still to me, the stories that you hear, the way that, that he addressed himself and the way that he stood in front of others and stood in front of a microphone even, and just what I hear about him and heard from him back when he was here, he had the ability and he did change lives with that smile, with his personality, with his attitude. And so I always think it's maybe a little bit too late sometimes when you think about, okay, what kind of attributes should I be taking from this person and try to be better in that myself? So. For you with Brian, when you look back on his legacy, what do you look back on and say, I want to embody that too and kind of honor Brian in that way and become a better person like Brian? I mean, just his all around personality and how he represented himself off the track. You know, you never, never saw Brian, you know, get real hot headed and lose his temper after he got wrecked, you know, before races, you know, he'd only drink water. That's something, you know, I already kind of did and, you know, I'm still 18, so I can't drink or anything, but, um, I hate soda and I hate pop. Um, so that was kind of easy, but to, to take over, but it was just, you know, he's well older than 21 and he could have done that. And, you know, everyone would go to the bars, especially dirt, you know, and, um, you know, he'd be sitting there drinking water and then. You know, he'd be the only person dedicated to the bottom at some races. And he just, you know, his, his race craft on, and just knowing when the dirt's going to come in exactly and just dedicated to the bottom or um, just everything. Um, and then obviously with Driven to Save Lives, you know, he's he's impacted so many lives without even still being here. You know, he's, you know, obviously he's here in spirit and up in a better place, you know, but uh yeah, it's just, it's, it's crazy how many lives you could touch and not even be here still. And you've only been on dirt a little bit. Do you still get that itch maybe every now and again to go? I know you got a lot of racing still to go and you're still very young. Do you ever get that itch to go, you know, I want to get back on dirt sometime, especially after two races this year in the trucks. Oh yeah. I, I'd love to do it. I really would. Um, my, my race that I, I, I really want to do is the Chili Bowl. Uh, love that race. I've ran Tulsa, never been great. Um, but I got it. I got to do the chili bowl. It's, uh, eventually I'll do it, but I really want to run a dirt midget a few times and then get a shot at the chili bowl. Um, I ran a micro sprint before Bristol dirt in, at Millbridge, uh, Chevy took us all. And I, I was like, man, like, I don't know how quick I'm going to be. I ran these. I've never been great at it, but I was like, man, I'm just, just going to be the biggest badass here and rip the fence. Like, doesn't matter how fast I am I'm just gonna look cool you know and I came in came off the racetrack and looked at the times you know Larson and Bowman and all these guys are here I'm like all right you know, I'm gonna get my butt whooped but at least I'll look cool on the fence you know I'm gonna be that guy just bounce it off the fence no matter how fast or not bounce it off the fence. I look at the times I ran like a 78 Larson ran an 80 and Bowman was at like an 85 and I was like all right that cool that cool man yeah yeah it felt real good walk around, get kind of myself and inside I'm just fist pumping, you know, just pumped up. But, uh, but yeah, it was, that was cool for me, obviously. Um, and, but yeah, just, those cars are so much fun, especially there just on the fence. And, and you know, I, I, I know I got to do it again. Every time I touched it, I was like, man, I, I gotta keep doing this. Well, Carson, it's been so much fun to watch you this season. So excited for once you get that first win. I don't know if it's going to come this year or not, but you've been on trend for that. You've been on track for that. I'm excited for once you finally get that view into victory lane. And right now, of course, the goal is 
the playoffs. Top 10 in points right now, and for the fifth time in series history, the NASCAR Camper World Truck Series visits Watkins Glen for the United Rentals 176 on August 7th. Last race before you can try to get clinched into the playoffs. Best of luck to you, Carson. Of course, thank you for joining the show. Appreciate your time and great talking with you. Yeah, thank you, Dev. Appreciate it. This is the Inside Lane on Sports 360 AZ NASCAR Championship Weekend at Phoenix Raceway coming up just four months away.